our speakers for today. We'll start with Iris Barrera. She's our nurse consultant educator here at Heartland National TV Center. Uh, she will be followed by uh, Maribel Mondrial, who's also a nurse consultant and educator here at Heartland. And lastly, we'll finish a case study with Catalina Navarro, uh, also one of our TV nurse consultant educators here at Heartland. So with that, I'd like to welcome everybody and welcome our first speaker, Iris Barrera. Thank you so much, Sophina. Hey, everybody. We are so excited to have you guys join us. I can tell from the chat box that you guys are from everywhere. Um, so please feel free to share the link with any of your friends who are not on right now. We are very excited to um, get this started. So without further ado, let's go over the goal of our presentation. So the goal of my presentation is to help to utilize current foundational knowledge to aid patients experiencing drug rash. Um, what I mean by current foundational knowledge is that we had our installment of the first um, Let's Hash Out the Drug Rash. That link is available on our website for you to review after this. Um, so we did share a lot of good information there. Now we're going to newly go over this stuff, and so these are our objectives. Describe the characteristics of three common types of skin lesions. Um, also utilize dermatological terminology to appropriately describe skin lesions, and then to list two rash identification resources. So I know it's lunchtime for a lot of you guys, and um, as a lot of you guys might know, I used to work in a public health department doing the same thing a lot of you TV nurses do, and so um, dermatology consults were kind of a, a unicorn. So we never got them. <laughs> you have no resources and you have this patient in front of you who has some sort of a skin condition. So I thought it would be really funny to share this. Um, it's an e-card and it says, I need a dermatology consult stat, said no one ever. But did they ask public health? I knew when I saw this, I was like, um, yeah, you didn't ask us. We would actually really like to have a dermatology consult um, every so often, like that would be great. So to recap some of the things we went over in our last presentation, um, the components of a rash assessment. So those include a physical assessment, gathering episode-specific information or the history surrounding this patient's reaction, obtaining laboratory and other data. And when we're talking about the physical assessment, just to briefly review, you're going to want to make sure once you ensure the patient is stable that um, the reaction's location. So is it on the patient's arms, legs, torso, face, hands, or feet? Um, it can also be on their scalp or on their back. So having them disrobe um, while providing privacy, of course, um, is going to help you to get all the information that you need um, to share with the physician so that you can plan the plan of care and the interventions for this patient. You're also going to want to note the texture. So the texture of this reaction, is it raised? Is it flat, scaly? Are there pustules? If there's pustules, note the color of the fluid, if there's any seeping, um, or is there sloughing? Um, in relation to the color of the skin, is it red, is it purple? And with the gloved hand, you're going to want to apply gentle pressure and see if it blanches, making note of that. You're also going to want to note the size in your physical assessment. Are there pinpoint um, reactions? Is it small? Is it large? And then the distribution, is it diffuse, is it covering like a whole area, or is it localized to one spot? And then noting whether it's warm to the touch, and you're always going to want to inspect the oral mucosa of a patient who's had any type of cutaneous reaction. So this is one of those resources that I told you about in our objectives. Um, I put the link here at the bottom, and I thought this was really good to share with you guys. Maybe you can print it out and put it in, laminate it, put it in some sort of binder in the clinic. It really helps you to kind of think ahead to maybe what might be manifesting in your patient. So first you're assessing the rash. We just talked about all the information you're going to gather. Some of the questions you can ask about that information are, are there fluid-filled lesions? If the answer is yes, was the fluid clear? If yes, then it could be a vesicular bulbous rash or a pustule, or no, it could be a pustular rash. Um, is it papular? And we're going to talk about that word here in a minute. So if, after we talk about it, if you can decide yes, it is papular, um, then you go across and it says it could be urticaria, it could be you know, a, a drug rash. So this is just something really nice for you guys to print out, keep with you. It actually came from a pediatric handbook, but it's pretty applicable across the board. Um, and after you've done your physical assessment, you're going to want to gather episode-specific information. So uh, your, things to ask the patient is, 
the allergies. Um, so your patients are on medication for upwards of six months or more, and sometimes their allergy status can change. They've started other medications with other physicians, so just assess whether or not they have any new allergies to medicines, if they're allergic to any foods, um, are there any other medications or remedies that they've started taking, um, when did they first notice the reaction? So was it a couple days ago, a couple hours ago? And is it inchy or painful? So ask, ask them subjectively, how, do, how does it feel? Have they been using a different detergent or any lifestyle changes? So just really trying to get an idea of what could be causing um, the reaction that they're having. Because later on, Maribel will share with you, it's not always um, the TB medication. So after you get all that information, figuring out how long after the dose of medication did the rash start. Was it minutes, hours, or days? Because um, sometimes you can have a, quite a delayed reaction to medications. Has this ever happened before with their TB medications? So there could be increasing sensitivity. Sometimes you'll have patients on intermittent medications, um, and the patient will share with you when they finally had some sort of reaction. Oh, well, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, I started with like a little itching, but nothing happened, and it went away. And then maybe the following week, I had a little bit of a rash, but you know, I took some Benadryl, and it went away. And they're not reporting those things because they come and go. They're so transient. So, you know, getting that information is going to help your physician to make some decisions. And then asking them if they've taken anything for the rash. So your physician is going to plan some interventions, and you're going to want to make sure that the patient hasn't taken anything that's going to interfere with that. And just to share some information about drug rash, typical symptoms include redness, bumps, blisters, hives, itching, sometimes peeling or pain. Keep in mind, every drug a person takes may have to be stopped to figure out which one is causing the rash, and that's okay. Um, the good thing about, you know, um, treating tuberculosis is that we do have time, and the most important thing is to make sure that they're on the safest regimen possible so that they're adherent. And most drug rashes will resolve once the drug is stopped. Mild reactions may be treated with creams to decrease symptoms, but serious reactions may require treatment with drugs such as epinephrine given by injection, Benadryl, or corticosteroids to prevent complications. So um, here's a reference uh, like visual that I had shared last time. I wanted to share with you this time, but also tell you what keyword I searched. So if you go to Google and you search rash terms with pictures, this is going to come up. Um, so just like look for the best version of it. This is another one that you can print out and put in some sort of a resource binder. Um, and I really like it because it, if you're looking at a patient and they have something that looks like this, this kind of helps you out a lot. But at the very least, it has a lot of dermatological terms that you can pull from um, whenever you're doing your assessment and documenting your assessment of the patient. The other thing um, that I use for a resource is up to date. A lot of you guys might use that. I did not know they had so much stuff on there for rash, so um, definitely check that out. So now to go over our new information. So um, we're going to go over dermatological terms and manifestations and when to appropriately utilize these terms whenever you're um, documenting your assessment of the patient's rash. So the first term we're going to go over is a macule. Um, macules are flat non-palpable lesions, usually less than 10 millimeters or 1 centimeter in diameter. Macules represent a change in color and are not raised or depressed compared to the skin's surface. A patch is a large macule. Examples include freckles, flat moles, and some allergic drug eruptions. So you want to make sure that when you're using these terms, you know what the specific definition is um, because your patient might be manifesting with something else. The other one I wanted to share with you is papules. Um, so papules are elevated lesions, usually less than 10 millimeters in diameter, that can be felt or palpated. Examples include nevi, warts, insect bites, and some lesions of acne. And so this one is italicized and asterisked for a reason. So the term maculopapular is often loosely and improperly used to describe many rashes. Because the term is nonspecific and easily misused, it should be avoided. Remember, a macule is less than 10 millimeters, and the pictured reaction is much bigger. Um, so if you are calling your physician and you tell them something like macular papular or macule, and you have something like this in front of you, it's not going to be as specific. So additional terms should be used. 
like the word confluent. Confluent means flowing or coming together, also running together. So you could say that this was uh, this patient had macular and papular lesions, and they're confluent, and then that paints a better picture for your physician. The next one we're going to go over is hives. So this one has a lot of different um, AKAs. Um, so I just shared a few, um, otherwise known as uticaria or wheels. With these ones, they're circumscribed raised erythematous plaques, also um, associated with central pallor. So if you look at this picture, in the middle of these lesions, it's a little lighter or a little paler, and then it goes out to being redder at the margin. So that's what that means. These lesions may be round, oval, or serpiginous with the wavy mar margins in shape and vary in size from less than one centimeter to several centimeters in diameter. They are intensely itchy. Individual lesions are transient, usually appearing and enlarging over the course of minutes to hours, and then disappearing within 24 hours. Lesions may coalesce or come together as they enlarge. So I've incorporated some polling questions for you guys. Um, that way you guys can kind of apply some of the terms that we've gone over. And since you can't actually touch these or physically assess these because they're pictures, I put some terms in here that are going to help you to make the decision. So um, if you could just go ahead from the uh, options and, you know, decide to you what dermatological term best describes these non-raised, blanching, arithmetous skin lesions. Is it A, macules, B, papules, C, hives, or D, maculopapular rash? So we're able to look in the chat box, and we see a lot of Ds and some As. Okay, I've got a B in here. Yep, still coming in hot, guys. Good. I'm glad you guys are all participating. It really helps everybody to kind of get each other's train of thought. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share the answer with you. So the answer is, in fact, A. So let's hear for the A's, guys. Um, and the rationale for that is that macules are the flat, non-palpable lesions that represent a change in color and are not raised or depressed compared to the skin's surface. Sorry, a little technical difficulty there. Um, so pictured here is a blanching arithmetous macular rash in a patient with measles. So again, this was non-raised and arithmetous. And so this is the definition of that. And yeah, this is a measles rash. All right, so another polling question, guys. What dermatological term best describes these raised skin lesions? So the keyword is raised. Is it A, macules, B, papules, C, hives, or D, maculopapular rash? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of Bs. Bs coming in hot. Yeah, I think the consensus is B, and you guys are absolutely right. So the rationale for that is that papules are the elevated lesions. They're usually less than one centimeter in diameter, and they can be felt or palpated. So pictured here for you guys are multiple hyperpigmented papules present on the face of a patient with dermatosis palposa nigra. And then our last polling question. What dermatological term best describes these well-circumscribed erythematous plaques that are intensely itchy? And probably most of you have had this. I know I have actually had this before, too. Intensely itchy is <coughs> literally, it doesn't do it justice. It's horrible. So I see a lot of Cs. Very good. OK, fantastic. So yes, the Cs have it. Hives, Madiville's clapping for you guys. You guys are doing great. So the hives are circumscribed. So you've got those circular type serpiginous um, borders there. Raised arithmetous plaques often associated with central pallor and are intensely itchy. The ones that are pictured is a uticarial drug eruption in a patient taking moxifloxacin. So very good. So this is a summary of this first portion of common skin lesions. 
Just remember, a thorough physical assessment is crucial um, to utilize. Okay, so uh, sorry, a physical assessment utilizing appropriate dermatological terms is critical to ass assisting the physician's recommendations and patient safety. So the whole reason for going through each of these terms is so that you feel empowered to know when it's a macule, when it's a papule, um, when it's, you know, hives, um, and when you need to use other terms. The term maculopapular is commonly misused and should be avoided. Additional terms like confluent can better describe the reaction's macular and or papular presentation and remembering the difference. Macules are flat discolorations and papules are elevated lesions. Neither are normally larger than the 10 millimeters or 1 centimeter in diameter. So that's it for my portion. I'm going to pass it over to Mati though, who's prepared some fantastic material for you guys. All right. Thank you, Iris, for that great presentation. And thank you, everybody online, for all your participation. This is great. We're so happy that everyone is participating. Um, and yes, so uh, now that we heard Iris' presentation, we should all have a good understanding of how to describe what we see when our patients experience a cutaneous reaction. So I do encourage you all to print out her slides, that table that she um, put up on there. It's going to be great uh, by your desk, so you can use it as a reference material. So now keeping all that in mind, when we do perform a physical assessment on our patients, we also need to consider that not all the rashes we are seeing are going to be drug-related. So let's say you receive a call from a patient that tells you they have a rash, and they think it's because of the TB medications. Well, first you want to bring them into the clinic, perform a thorough assessment, uh, maybe draw some labs and gather some episode-specific information. Then you need to think a bit, analyze all that information, and ask yourself, is this really a drug rash? And so then in this presentation portion, I'm going to talk about some atypical drug rashes. I'm going to define why some of these rashes are not drug rashes. And then we're going to test your knowledge with a self-check question uh, near the end. So now back to that patient that called to the clinic complaining of a rash. So um, on an assessment, you find the patient started their TB therapy about three weeks ago. Uh, you see they have multiple arrhythmatous papules, primarily on their wrist and their fingers. They state the symptoms started about three days ago and that it's intense itching and it's worse at night. So with that information, you know, you want to ask, is this a drug rash? So just quickly wanted to recap what was discussed on the first installment of this presentation and also Iris just went over some on her slides. Um, some typical components of a drug rash is that it is systemic, so it should start on any part of the body and it will spread to other areas. The rash does stop when the offending medication is stopped and it typically lasts anywhere from 2 to 21 days um, and it will manifest or it can as macular or papular, uh, pruritic or arithmetic. So let's go back to this case here. Some key words is that we find the, uh, the itching and the redness that we saw was primarily on the wrist and the fingers, and it was really just worse at night. So is this a rash? No. And in this case, in fact, what it was was scabies. So, and I bring this to your attention because here at Heartland, this is something that we've consulted on actually quite a bit um, through our binational program. We've even seen cases here at the Texas Center for Infectious Disease. It's not uncommon because scabies is not uncommon. Um, it is an infestation of the skin by the burrowing mite, uh, Cyclopsis scabies, and it's transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact. So it can be somebody in your family, a sexual partner, someone that you're close with. Um, and it manifests as intense eruption of pruritic papules with characteristic distribution. So some common areas where you'll find this is in the fingers, the wrist, the axilla, the areola, and the genitalia. I just wanted to bring um, some visuals for you. So this is the one from the scenario. Again, classic scabies will present with multiple small uh, erythematous papules, often excoriated because, of course, they cause that severe itching that's worse at night. It has a diffuse distribution, and the back is relatively free of involvement. So that's key there to remember because we know when it's a systemic reaction, uh, typically the trunk and the back are very, you know, involved. So here you'll know if someone doesn't have anything on the back, 
and maybe it's not a true drug rash. And in young children and infants, you'll see this more on the palms, the soles, and the fingers. Here is, um, this is very classic of scabies. Again, uh, you can find burrows, which are these thin gray, red, or brown lines. Um, oftentimes, they're not visible, though, because of the excoriation from that intense itching. But if you do catch one, you'll see that they're about two to five millimeters in diameter. And then we have crested scabies uh, with poorly defined arrhythmic patches that quickly develop prominent thick scale crust. So this one is seen more in older adults or immune compromised persons. Uh, they do develop on the scalp, hands, and feet, although any skin area can be affected. So um, with that, if you happen to suspect scabies because of what we just learned a little bit about scabies, you want to ask your patient if the itching happens to be worse just at night. Is the itching widespread? Now, usually it's not found on the head unless it's an infant or a young child. Um, and is there any other household members or uh, sexual partners with similar symptoms? So obviously, you know, if your patient's not the only one itching at home, then you want to ask some more specific questions to try to find out if it is indeed a drug rash. So with that being said, there are some other atypical rashes that we see, and I would like to go over those with you and just give you some information so that way we can, you know, have a better assessment of our patient, asking some more specific questions. So another type of rash that we've seen and been consulted on is miliaria or heat rash. This is transient, uh, and obviously it's caused uh, by heat that the body is getting too hot. Um, and what happens is the sweat that gets occluded and inflamed. So if you're in a hot and humid environment, lots of physical activity, or if you happen to have a febrile illness, uh, you can uh, get heat rash. So it's very common. I'm sure we all have seen it in newborns, neonates, infants, children. But it does also happen in adults. Um, and it's even been reported in patients that are treated with um, some pathomimetic drugs like clonidine, opioids, or even beta blockers. So some manifestations. Um, we have miliaria crystallina. So this is common in neonates. Usually it's found on the head, neck, or the upper trunk. You will see superficial vesicles that measure one to two millimeters in diameter. There's no inflammation here. They can be asymptomatic. Uh, and in adults, you'll see it commonly on the trunk. Then we have the miliaria rubra. This one, you'll see arrhythmatous papules that measure two to four millimeters in diameter. They can be papulovesticular or pustular. Um, itching and stinging often, you know, is worse when the sweating is occurring. So it's very common in infants in their skin folds. So if you do have a, a you know, pediatric patient that started uh, their TB meds and you're concerned whether it's the TB meds or if maybe they're having just a heat rash, you want to inspect and see the skin folds. So the neck, the axle, the groin. Anhydrosis or the absence of sweating can occur in these affected areas. So that's something else to just kind of keep in mind. Then we have miliaria profunda. So here we see arrhythmatous skin-colored firm papules, uh, about one to four millimeters in diameter. These are caused by uh, deep blocks in the sweat duct. So somebody maybe who has repeated episodes of rubra, uh, you may see this profunda. It's common in adults, usually on the trunk, but it can be on any extremity. And again, it does cause that anhydrosis. Um, and then there's compensatory hyperhidrosis in non-affected areas, which can lead to inefficient thermal regulation, which is a little scary when it comes to our pediatric patients. So this is something that, you know, if we catch on time and we can refer out to a specialist, we want to be able to, you know, help the patient that way. So moving on, I want to touch a little on psoriasis. Uh, we know this is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. Uh, that is associated with multiple comorbidities. It is a multi-system um, disorder. Other comorbidities that is linked to psoriasis are psoriatic arthritis, um, hypertension, diabetes, and this affects males as well as females. The typical onset is in adulthood, although it can occur at any age, and some psoriasis types do start uh, early on in age. So some of the clinical manifestations here for plaque psoriasis is some erythematous plaque, sharply defined margins, as you can see in this picture here, that are 
um, anywhere from less than one to greater than 10 centimeters. They have a thick, silvery scale. That is very common. Uh, pruritus is common. However, they can be asymptomatic. The second type is butate. This one you can see on the picture. It's um, multiple small sporadic papules and plaques. Usually these are smaller than one centimeter, uh, and they're common on the trunk and the proximal extremities. So then we move on to generalized <coughs> pustular. Uh, here you can see erythema, scaling, and sheets of superficial pustules. Some of the causes can be pregnancy, infection, uh, and withdrawal of glucocorticoids. So um, lots of patients that we know have immuno uh, diseases, maybe they're taking steroids for X number of reasons. You know, you want to do a good baseline assessment, see if they even have underlying issues already. But just keep in mind all these keywords so we can start thinking, you know, maybe it's not just a drug rash. And this one here can actually be very life-threatening because it does become, you know, involved, it's system, systemic. Then there is the erythrodermic. This one is uncommon, but when it does occur, it can be acute or chronic. It does present with generalized erythema and scaling on most of the body surface area. And there's a high risk for infection and electrolyte imbalance secondary to fluid loss. So again, that is uh, very important when we have those shifts in our electrolytes. And then we come to sugars. Um, so everybody has seen, maybe not this one, <laughs> but sugar spikes. Um, they're caused by the larval form of trambiculid mites. So they are encountered in areas such as grasslands, forests, lakes, and streams. So this would be good if you suspect you want to ask you know, your patients, have you been uh, out hiking on a trail or uh, biking on trails, maybe fishing at a lake? If, if they have, then maybe you could you know, ask a couple more questions. Um, mites can produce cutaneous lesions with allergic reactions, and sometimes these are also referred to as harvest mites, harvest bugs, harvest lice, or mowers mites. Now, some cutaneous manifestations of these sugar spikes. Um, they, they do cause inflammation. They cause intense itching. They may be grouped papules or papillal vesicles that measure one to two millimeters in length. Uh, they appear bright red or red-brown in color. They can be flat or raised. And ankles and waistline are often the most affected areas. So in the picture here, I've you know, zoomed in and cropped. But the first picture is an ankle, and the second picture is actually on the waistline. Uh, and in boys, they do suffer from a hypersensitivity response to sugar spikes. Those will manifest with penile swelling, pruritus, and dysuria. So I want to talk about invasive candida infection. So we all know candida is a fungus. Um, however, once it does become present in the bloodstream, that's what we call candidemia. So it has now, you know, that's invasive candida. Um, Catalina is going to talk a little bit more about systemic uh, infections. Um, but this is just one that I wanted to quickly touch on. The people that are at highest risk for this are those that are immunocompromised and patients that are in the intensive care unit. So um, this would be someone maybe who has a hematologic malignancy, uh, a recipient of a transplant, or somebody that's receiving chemotherapy. Now, the manifestations of invasive candida can range from a mild fever to full-blown sepsis. But if we take a look here at these manifestations, um, it can, they can occur as eye lesions, skin lesions, and less commonly a muscle abscess. Um, but in the skin lesion, they do appear sudden and painless as clusters of pustules with an uh, arithmetic base. So because they're painless, if you know that your patient has some underlying condition that I just described <laughs> on the previous slide, uh, you know, you want to make sure that when they come to their monthly visit, you have them either disrobe if they have a sweater on to remove it. You want to inspect their skin because, again, they may not even know that they have this. If it is painless and it doesn't cause any kind of itching, um, it does manifest on any area of the body. Sizes can vary from tiny pustules to nodular up to several centimeters in diameter, which may appear necrotic in the center, as in this first picture here to your left. Um, in severely neutropenic patients, the lesions may be macular rather than pustular. 
All right, and lastly, sorry guys, I know it's lunchtime, <laughs> but um, bed bugs, they're present all around the world. They're obligate blood feeding insects that inhabit human dwellings. Um, and of course, they can cause cutaneous reactions as well. So the spread of infestation occurs, you know, if someone's traveling, um, they can hide in furniture. Um, if you're in an apartment complex or a building that there's a bed bug infestation can just go rampant. So they don't live on humans, but they live in between, you know, the furniture and the mattresses that humans use uh, because they're attracted to the host by the warmth. And generally, they do all their feeding at night while we sleep. So here, are the classic appearance is a two to five millimeter uh, arithmetic papule or wheel with a central hemorrhagic punctum. It may appear as papular uh, urticaria. A linear series of bites may be found upon awakening. So that top picture there, you can see kind of a, a little linear uh, area. And some people only have asymptomatic purpurous macules. So the bites usually resolve in one week, which is a good thing. <laughs> and so, that was just a quick run through, guys. I just want to mention there are many other uh, conditions where uh, dermatolog dermatological um, manifestations are seen on your patients. So again, print out those handouts that Iris talked about. They're going to really help you. So just a quick self-check question here. And we'll be looking at the chat box if you guys want to chime in. So if there's a 27-year-old male patient who has been on RIVE for the past eight weeks, um, comes into the clinic complaining of some itching, some red spots that he noticed on his hands and his legs yesterday morning when he woke up. He states that the itching was so bad that he had trouble sleeping. On exam, the nurse notices small arrhythmic papules in between his fingers on his lower legs and on his lower legs only. So when questioned about any recent travel, the participant, the participant, I'm sorry, that's you guys. <laughs> the patient <laughs> states he has been home all weekend except when he left to pick up a new sofa that his wife purchased at a yard sale. So the patient denies any other symptoms. And based on that, which of the following do you feel best describes the cause of his cutaneous reaction? Would that be a drug rash, psoriasis, scabies, sugar spikes, or none of the above? Just going to let you guys answer a couple. And ooh, so we look like, it looks like everybody is on point. <laughs> so the answer is yes, uh, C, scabies. And it looks like everybody was um, concise on that. Um, because again, they purchased that used sofa that maybe already came with um, some gifts for them. And the itching <coughs> and the uh, redness was only between the fingers and also on the ankle. So that is typical of Gabe. Thank you, guys. I'm going to hand it over to Catalina that's going to talk to us about uh, something that's a little bit more serious that we all need to keep an eye out for. So here we go, Catalina. Thank you, Maribel. And thank you, everybody. Um, in the next 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to present a challenging case of a young lady uh, who developed a really bad rash. Uh, with systemic symptoms while she was taking treatment for tuberculosis. So uh, this is just to recap from our previous RASH webinar where we learned that the drug-induced reactions can be classified according with the time of onset. So you can find immediate reactions that uh, are those reactions that uh, you can occur on the observation. So, for example, you have a patient in your clinic, you give, you give the first dose of um, RIPE, and you ask them to stay in the clinic, and you can see maybe one hour, hour and a half, the patient starts complaining of some urticaria, hives, uh, some angioedema, and this is the typical anaphylaxis um, uh, reaction. Uh, in the last webinar, Maribel presented one of the case studies about anaphylaxis. On the other hand, the delayed reactions are those that occur usually uh, days after the offending medication is receiving, uh, more frequently weeks to months after the start of the medication. Um, this 
delayed reactions are characterized by severe eruptions and also uh, some systemic reactions. Um, examples of these delayed re uh, reactions are the Steven Johnson syndrome and the DRESS syndrome that I am going to talk today. So DRESS stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. This is a life-threatening drug reaction that includes rash with systemic symptoms. Um, your patient maybe is going to have fever, macular exanthema, erythematous facial swelling, malaise, and uh, lymphadenopathy, as well as the um, um, dress has to have um, organ involvement so you can see uh, patients with um, inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the kidney or the heart, and also uh, more than 70% of the patients with DRESS are going to present eosinophilia. And this is just to remember eosinophilia is an increase in the number of eosinophils in the blood. So more than 6% of eosinophils are considered eosinophilia as well as uh, more than 500 um, eosinophils by microliter of blood is considered eosinophilia. Uh, most often, uh, eosinophilia indicates a parasitic infection, an allergic reaction, or cancer. Um, what is the epidemiology of DRESS? Uh, the frequency of DRESS varies. It depends on the type of the drug that the patient is taking and the immune uh, status of the patient. The incidence is estimated between one by a thousand and one to ten thousand patients uh, that, are, that are receiving an offending drug and develop DRESS. Fatality rate may be up to 10 percent. Um, uh, typically, the DRESS syndrome the symptoms start 1 to 12 weeks after the start of the uh, offending medication. Uh, this is typical from the death syndrome that the symptoms may continue despite the discontinuation of the offending drug. Frequently, it's associated uh, with the reactivation of the herpes virus infection. Okay. Uh, medications that have been reported to cause stress include anti-convulsants anti and allopurinol. Uh, we know that any medication can cause stress, but the most common that triggers stress uh, include the carbamazepine or phenytoin. These are medications to treat uh, seizures. Uh, allopurinol is another trigger medication. Uh, that is uh, used to treat gout, but they, there have been a dress, a, a dress syndrome associated with some anti-TB drugs, and this is one of the cases that I am bringing today. So the case study, uh, is, this is a 21-year-old healthy female. Uh, she had prior treatment for latent TB with INH. Uh, she didn't have any known allergies, and she was diagnosed with cavitary pulmonary TB uh, in January 2014 by a local health department. And I'm going to show these calendars to illustrate the course of treatment and the, um, uh, the developing of the rash. So she started a right therapy in February 5th, 2014. Uh, she just complained some, uh, with some nausea after medications, but uh, it just uh, lasts a few hours. The LFTs were normal. March 2014, she was improving, cl uh, improving clinically. Uh, she just reported some mild nausea after medications, but the LFTs were repeatedly normal. Uh, two months, uh, like a eight weeks on treatment, the lab reported that the patient has a TB, a, a low level resistant to INH. So in April, uh, the doctors decided to stop INH, and the treatment was fortified 
with uh, the addition of uh, one of the fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin, and one injectable, the amicase. And um, another um, reason that they included uh, this injectable and the levo, it was because she was not, um, she was delayed in convert the AAB smears to negative. So in May 14, she started complaining of new symptoms, like side effects. She complained of headache, nausea, some fever. She started uh, getting some chills, malaise, and the physical examination uh, and the LFTs were normal. The following day, uh, March 15, uh, the symptoms were worsened, and she was taken to the emergency department um, because she now has diarrhea, um, continue with fever, and she was uh, diagnosed with, the, with a UTI, an infectious diarrhea, and she was prescribed some uh, additional um, antibiotics and Tylenol. So she went home, uh, but in May 20, 2014, the symptoms worsened and she started presenting rash. She was seen by the healthcare provider. The TB meds were stopped in May 20th, and she was uh, uh, admitted to the local hospital in May 22. The labs at the admission, um, you can see that the LFTs were elevated uh, more, uh, up to more than five times at the normal limit, also, the total bilirubin was high to 2.3, uh, and the patient uh, um, presented a really severe rash. And I'm going to show pictures of the rash during that hospitalization. These are pictures of the patient, and you can see the rash uh, was described by the doctors as a morbidly form and progressed to involve the neck, face, and the upper extremities. You can see here that uh, the arms show macular and papular uh, uh, diffuse er um, eruption. Uh, the doctors also um, point that she had ulcerations in the mouth, uh, extensive mu oral mucositis, and ulcers in the tongue and the buccal mucos. So this it was a severe uh, rash. Um, she uh, was receiving uh, IV steroids uh, during hospitalization. Uh, these are additional pictures. Hospital day three, uh, she, the um, rash progressive to the abdomen. You can see here in the abdomen this confluent macular and papular uh, uh, rash. Um, in your right side, you can see a picture of the wrist. Uh, these are kind of petechial rash, almost purpuric the rash, um, with this small red and um, purple spot. These are additional pictures of the patient. Uh, hospitalization day five, uh, the rash um, compromised the lower extremities. And remember that the medications, uh, the TB meds, were stopped on May 20th. And these pictures are from May 26th. Um, so the, um, in the right picture, you can see the patient has a face swollen. Uh, so this is another characteristic of dress. Uh, however, after this last uh, um, uh, Pictures, the patient starts uh, doing better and the rash starts just um, uh, disappear. Um, she, the, the fever subsided in June 1st. However, the LFTs uh, began to rise dram dramatically. And in the next chart, you are going to see how the LFTs just present. Um, you can see in red the LFTs values during hospitalization. You see here that in June, June 1st, the LFTs reached the peak 
with values in the 5,000, uh, the AST, and the 3,000, the ALT. Uh, it was a really um, liver dysfunction, and it was so severe that the physicians contemplated a liver transplant for this patient. Uh, however, if you see in June 4 to June 9, um, the values of the LFTs just drop, and they went almost back to normal. Um, so um, it was a dramatically uh, improved uh, of the liver. So uh, the physician threw out other possible causes of liver failure, and they did. H she was HIV negative. The hepatitis panel was negative. Uh, the CT of the abdomen was normal. Uh, the high risk scan, the ultrasound, they did all kind of evaluations to check for another uh, um, cause of the liver failure, but everything was negative. And this is a picture of the patient at the end of the hospitalization. The rash improved, uh, the mucositis resolved, the LFTs normalized, and the fever also resolved by June 1st. And she was discharged from the hospital in June 9th. So she was off of the TB medications, and the doctors were uh, wait two more weeks to start a rechallenge. Uh, on June 23, uh, the doctor at the health department decided to start a rechallenge with the FAMPIN 600 milligrams. Uh, the patient took the medication, and she just complained some, with the, some a slight dizziness and mild nausea, but resolved quickly. So the doctor decided to give the second dose of refamping uh, the following day, but later that day, the patient complained of severe abdominal pain, nausea, fever. She had some, some rash, diffuse rash, and she appeared to be young. So the refamping was held, and the patient was readmitted to the local hospital. Uh, these are the, uh, some labs from the hospitalization number two. Um, if you see, the LFTs were within normal limits. However, the total bilirubin was really high. The doctor suspected cholecystic jaundice, and they ruled out this problem, but everything was uh, normal. Um, they noticed also eosinophilia, that uh, the, uh, was 17%, was high. And due to the spike in the total bilirubin after just two doses of refamping, the patient required specialized TB care and she was transferred uh, to San Antonio, Texas. And she was diagnosed with intolerance to the rifamycin. So she was transferred to San Antonio, Texas, to the Texas Center for Infectious Diseases. This is a unique 75-bed specialty hospital with single isolation rooms. Uh, TCID has provided quality care as inpatient facility for four patients with tuberculosis since 1953. But this is a picture that, of the new building that was redesigned in 2011. So she was admitted to the TCID on July 7th. The labs on admission uh, were within normal limits. And the doctors at the TCID decided to rechallenge with um, second line medications because they knew that she was low level INH resistant and she was uh, intolerant to rifamycin. So they did the rechallenge every three days with uh, really close monitoring. Uh, the patient was able to tolerate the moxifloxacin, etambutol, linezolid, and the amicase. She tolerated these medications well. However, 12 days after TB medications were restarted, uh, she presented with eosinophilia uh, with the peak at 22%. But other than that, she was clinically stable. She didn't develop any uh, rash during the hospitalization. She didn't have any GI symptoms. 
Um, and I want to emphasize that during the whole hospitalization at TCID, the labs were stable. And the next uh, slide is going to be a chart. Uh, this chart shows the summary of the labs since uh, May when she presented the first allergic reaction. You can see here that the LFTs uh, that are in red and green uh, had the peak at the beginning of June, but after that episode, the LFTs just stabilized and during the hospitalization from July, August, they were normal. Also, the total bilirubin went back to normal, as well as the eosinophilia. So the TCID uh, treatment plan changed. So uh, she was um, low-level INH resistant. She had low-level INH resistant tuberculosis, but she uh, was not tolerating the rifamycin, so she needed to be treated as a patient with MDRTD. Um, and the new plan was to extend treatment for 12 more months, and the patient was given credit for the treatment received prior uh, to admission. So remember that she received uh, from February to May ripe, so she had a good treatment with the rifamycin. Uh, the hospital course at TCID, the patient improved clinically, radiographically, and bacteriologically. A patient was discharged from TCID on March 2015, and she continued uh, TB treatment by DOT as outpatient. Uh, DRESS was highly considered in the differential diagnosis, but how could you confirm or exclude DRESS? So there is not a criterion standard for diagnosis of DRESS, but the European Registry of Severe Cutaneous Adverse Reactions, the REGISCAR, developed a scoring system based on the rash of the patient, the organ involvement, uh, the clinical course, like the fever, lymphadenopathy, other symptoms, and uh, they developed a nice um, tool to, uh, to help to score the dress. So this is the link. I'm gonna try to do this live. This is the link to the Registar website. Okay, you just uh, answered that question, like security question, and now you can see here the list of the questionnaire. It's a little uh, small, but you can do this um, uh, in your computer. Uh, these are the questionnaire that you will answer regarding your patient. I'm gonna do this quickly since we are, uh, we are run out of time. So the patient uh, had fever, yes. The patient had a, a enlarged lymph nodes. In this particular case, the patient didn't have any lymphadenopathy. Did she have a typical lymphocytosis? Yes. Did she have eosinophilia? Yes. And it was more than 20%. A skin rash? Yes. The rash was more than 50% of the body? Yes. At least with edema, infiltration, and purpura, or this TB rash? Yes. Did she uh, have a bio biopsy suggesting dress? No. In this case, she didn't have any biopsies. Internal organ involvement, one organ at least, the liver was involved in this syndrome. The resolution in 15 days, and the doctor excluded alternative diagnosis, Yes, you just click here, next, and you are gonna have the result. The score right here is six. I didn't mean that she had a definite diagnosis of dress. I'm gonna ask Marilyn to close. Okay. So if you still uh, write uh, down, the scoring cutoff points is uh, less than two, no dress, two to three, possible dress, four to five, a probable, and six, 
or more definite diagnosis of stress. So um, this is a, a snapshot of the results, and you see that she had a definite stress diagnosis. So this concludes the case study. Um, but let, let's move on to the final comment. If you happen to have a patient with severe rash and you suspected dress, uh, please perform a complete skin exam, like Iris and Maribel said, it's really, really important to do a thorough uh, examination. Um, order labs if you have a patient that is having a, a face swollen or severe rash. Uh, obtain a medication list to identify what is the medication that is causing this drug re reaction. If you have a patient that is, has HIV or the patient that is taking any other medications, if the a patient with seizures, uh, keep in mind that the other medications can precipitate dress. Review uh, the, the clinical history and stop or substitute all suspect medications and seek hospitalization in addition to expert consultation. Uh, I want to emphasize the importance of a patient education. Most patients with dress, they recover completely in weeks or months after the drug is withdrawn. However, these patients are prone to develop another episode of rash, and in some cases, a severe episode. Um, sometimes they can develop stress with other different medications than the, the previous one that they had. Um, some autoimmune diseases have been reported after episodes of, of stress, like uh, diabetes or uh, any other autoimmune disease. So it's important to uh, teach the patient about this. Also, to ask, uh, uh, to let the patient know that if she or the, the patient develops any rash, any allergic reaction with any medication, to seek medical attention. And some points to take home, importance of the detailed medical history, medication history, documentation of all reactions, uh, important to take pictures and just put it in the chart. Uh, when patient presents with combination of rash and facial swelling or the CBC and LFTs. And remember that signs and symptoms of dress can be, can continue even if the, pay, if the medication uh, has been stopped. So I want to acknowledge Dr. Barbara Seward, who was consulted in this challenging case Dr. Adriana Vasquez and Dr. Aniki Silvas, the doctors who care for this patient at the Texas Center for Infectious Diseases. And uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, so we are still here. <laughs>